good morning good afternoon and good evening all in whichever time zone you are in today uh, and i hope everyone is staying safe in this covid times in our new normal uh, before i start this presentation i want to thank uh, dr vinod skaria for inviting me uh, to present in this symposium of pediatrics neurogenomics given all the advances in genetics and genomics this symposium is a very timely symposium and looking at the talks that are uh, assembled together for this symposium this is the most up to date knowledge that is available uh, today so with that i will jump into my presentation i'm going to talk about essentials for a pediatric neurologist interpretation of a genetic report this is my financial disclosure i am an employee of perkin almo so before we get into a clinical report itself i think it's really important that we all spend a few minutes on some background information which is very important when looking at a clinical report the first thing is that genomic testing has several milestones Uh, we have all seen in the past uh, uh, few years starting with 1975 a sudden blot was used to identify new genes who uh, identify genes or rather regions because at that time no new genes were identified walk the chromosome regions after which came the radioactive labeling for the sink, uh, sequencing method which we used to load radioactively label nucleotides on the agarose gel followed by fluorescent neuro uh, sequencing sanger sequencing and then the advent of next generation sequencing which you see here with the uh, the solid instrument the illumina and now uh, oxford nanofor and now the most recent ones being nova seq the reason i show this slide is for two uh, for two reasons basically the first one being that even though we have made so many advances in technology sudden blot is still today use sanger sequencing is also used so understanding when that technique has to be used and how that technique is used for a particular setting in a genetic uh, uh, testing modality and how that is interpreted in a genetic report is very important moving on from that to the actual gene level looking at a gene in a structured framework what you see here on the left hand side is a phenotype disease genes and pathways which all come together under the structure of human phenotype ontology or hpo terminology which is commonly used and then the idea here is that you have this integrated output of the phenotype disease the genes and the applying the pathways behind the identification of the gene into a integrated clinical report but you have noticed that i have said this word genes many times and this is important to kind of follow up on the why in this structured framework the genes are very important and why it is important to understand this for a genetic test the importance of genes is that understanding the spectrum of that gene the variant spectrum of the gene and the pathogenic spectrum of the gene now about 2000 genes so far in the 22000 genes in the human genome really have a well defined phenotype well assessed uh, in the literature through several studies the rest of the genes about 4000 odd genes which are today shown to be causative of disease are new genes we really don't know their variant spectrum so what you see on this slide is on one hand is duchenne muscular dystrophy a classic neuromuscular disorder pediatric onset but it stands on its own in terms of its variant spectrum as a majority of the pathogenic variants are deletions or duplications followed by a lesser number 35% are point mutations or sequence variants and then on the other side if we can take a example again of a neurological disorder is rett syndrome where 80% are sequence variants and 20% are deletion duplications 
So when ordering testing, it is critical that it is understood that the lab that is going to perform the testing is doing comprehensive testing because it is possible today. About 10 years ago, it had to be cascade testing or reflex testing where you first sequence and then you look for copy number variation using a microarray and before that we had to do a southern blot analysis. But today with next generation sequencing, it is entirely possible to look at all the variants at the same time. For this reason, the method on a genetic report is important for the physician to read when the report comes back on a patient, especially when the report is negative and we will come to it later on. Now sticking on the same theme of uh, genes and uh, the mutation spectrum, the other event that has happened with, un with the new gene discovery is a growing complexity of genomics. Today we have we have moved away from this monogenic gene concept. We have one gene causing one disorder, many genes causing one disorder, or uh, uh, the one disorder caused by many genes, unrelated disorders, surprise disorders which we never associated with the genes previously. Now one same gene can cause a dominant and a recessive disorder and one example in the world of neurology is calpin 3 for neuromuscular disorder where a much milder type is autosomal dominant type and it's an in-frame event and we will talk about that later a little bit. And then now the more recent ones is description of uh, diagenic uh, disease inheritance where two genes in two, uh, two variants in two separate genes in a common pathway can cause a disorder. One, uh, one uh, another possibility which I have not yet put here is the allele specific um, imbalance where in a recessive condition you find only one pathogenic variant but at the RNA level and at the tissue level that one specific variant becomes a dominant variant and causes disease. So it's really important to understand this complexity when ordering now taking that same concept a little bit further, I wanted to give some examples here on this slide is a locus heterogeneity where many genes equal to one disease and you can see cardiomyopathies, autism spectrum disorders, ciliopathies and limb girdle muscular dystrophy uh, in that category. Allelic heterogeneity where we are all familiar with the DMD variants which cause Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy. And then LRRK2 variants which cause par Parkinson's disease and inflammatory bowel disease but the variants are of different types. Then pathogenic variants of, uh, of varying clinical consequence. This is really not well understood. And uh, cystic fibrosis is a great example of that where there is just so much complexity that is built into that variant and the impact of those variants on human health. FKRP uh, is a, a neuromuscular disorder and again there are uh, examples in there where it's not completely understood yet. And then the phenotypic overlap which gets even more confusing with the, uh, with the limb girdle muscular dystrophies and inherited cardiomyopathies as being good examples. So with that the new technology with this complex setting of understanding and the growing complexity of understanding genetics and genomics we are today ordering genetic testing and we expect that a clinical report that comes back to us is clean, clear and succinct for a physician to take that report and use it for patient care. So let's jump into now looking at the three options which are commonly ordered today which is the gene panels, exome and genome. Then we'll look at a little bit of the technique and jump into the genetic uh, reports itself and interpretation of it. So first thing is comparison of the different sequencing options. Panels, you have a smaller region. The gene panels range today anywhere from five genes to 200 genes. For example, the lowest, the largest one possibly is autism where at times some labs also offer 2000 genes. Because you are sequencing a smaller region, you can have a higher depth of coverage. Today we can detect the uh, copy number variation or multiple exon deletions and duplications in the gene. 
but has limited incidental findings. That does not mean that the incidental findings are not there because if a gene is causing two distinct disorders, then you are going to pick it up, such as Gaucher disease, the GBA gene can cause Gaucher disease, but also is associated with Parkinson's disease. Now with exome, uh, it's a little bit lower depth of co coverage you are going to get because you're targeting the entire exome. It's about one to 2% of the genome, but you are going to get incidental findings. And then the genome, which is you are going to target the entire 3GB of the genome itself, but a 30 to 40X genome or depth coverage. So this is the first uh, interpretation of the genetic report that when a genome is ordered, it is at 30 to 40X coverage compared to exome and a gene panel. According to the uh, uh, ACMG guidelines, panels and exomes are run, run at 100X and the genome is about 30 to 40x. 40x is ideal because you're going to pick up all the insertions and deletions as well. So when a lab report comes, it's important to check, just quickly go to the methodology and check if the method is described properly and the depth of the sequencing is uh, mentioned there and the metrics are given, especially when a report is negative. A lot of my comments are going to say this, uh, a lot of my slides rather, I'm going to end with this sentence that when a report is negative, it's really important to look what the next generation sequencing assay is actually covering. The next one is the, uh, you know, the path to identifying the molecular diagnosis. As we saw in one of the earlier slides, there are just so many techniques now that are available. And generally, and rightly so, a physician tries to order based on the diagnosis where you might have a more precise diagnosis, such as um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, or let's take the example of epilepsy where Dravet syndrome, there is more defined and a narrow diagnosis, then the physician might just order a single gene, but more likely nowadays to be a panel. But then when the spectrum of the uh, clinical presentation is just so broad that it is very difficult to narrow it down, then we are going to the exome, medical exome, which is about the 5,000 genes, exome, which is 22,000 genes, and then the genome, which is the 22,000 genes, and the rest of the uh, intragenic and the intergenic sequence or the junk DNA, which we, so the so-called junk DNA, which is the intergenic sequence. Microarrays have been used uh, uh, for now over a decade, but we, microarrays are now very get, quickly getting replaced with whole genome sequencing at a lower depth. So instead of doing whole genome at 40X, if you run the whole genome at 5X, you're gonna pick up more copy number variants at a better resolution than a microarray. So this is all very quickly happening. Clinical labs are offering it. And it's really important to understand when a clinical report comes back at what all these methods do and does the lab describe it properly or not. Again, especially if the report is negative. Now, obviously there's a reason why uh, uh, testing is ordered. And uh, aside from the actual diagnosis, you're looking for an explanation of the genetic basis of that clinical presentation but at times we are nowadays very surprised when genes which are associated with a particular disorder get reported for something more broad and as a physician you start wondering if this is really uh, clear or not and at that point it's important to open up and collaborate instead of just discarding the gene as not associated with your patient's phenotype. Intrafamilial vari uh, variability is also important when more than one person in the same family is affected. And then today, the presumed monogenic disorders of unknown cause, where these are extremely rare disorders, multiple testing has been done and no answers have been found. How do you go about it? All this boils down to the importance of uh, testing and what as a physician you are looking for. The first thing is many of these clinical uh, or genetic disorders rather are can be a little confusing if they are not so defined. Uh, today we know that we can see blended phenotypes, there could be dual diagnosis or there could be some unknown etiology which is underlying this diagnosis and which makes it a little bit confusing when you're ordering a uh, test.
So for example, a gene panel based on your diagnosis versus a genome which is really uh, unbiased uh, approach to diagnosis where you're covering everything. And at times there are surprises. We very often get cases in our lab where a gene panel is done, a pathogenic variant is identified, but the physician comes back and says, oh, this does not explain the full clinical spectrum of my patient. And this is really a tricky thing to do because you know, you obviously want to make sure that the patient can afford testing. Again, it depends on which part of the world you are in. In the U.S., it is very likely to be, you know, insurance-based testing, whereas in India, it is uh, cash uh, uh, payment. So it's it, it's approach based on your ab uh, on the patient's ability to pay for the test as well. So it does get complicated when ordering the test uh, test. But the consequences, if you look at an undiagnosed case, is can be very big now because, uh, you know, the therapeutic world has uh, kind of made significant advances and there will could be missed opportunities for improved medical management and a missed opportunity to also order the right test and then thereby affecting the family members. I'm going to give one quick verbal example of a... Uh, uh, missed opportunity for improved medical management. We had a whole genome sequencing case in our lab where uh, at birth this uh, uh, this child was uh, identified uh, to have trisomy 21. By the time this child became about five years old, uh, the physician quickly realized that this is not just trisomy 21. Um, I need to order uh, something more. And they ordered whole genome sequencing where we found a pathogenic variant in the GLA gene which causes Fabry disease. And as you know that there is an enzyme replacement therapy available for Fabry disease called the Fabrizyme and the child became eligible for it. But imagine if this physician had waited much longer to actually order the appropriate testing. So with that, let's reports and what a structure of a report should be. So College of American Pathologists actually gives these guidelines on how a structured report should look like. The first important thing is writing this informative clinical reports where a physician can take it and interpret it for patient care. The usage of the test which is either a single gene to panels and exomes and genomes has to be clearly defined. Essential elements of reporting, we will go to them next. And then the last and probably in the next five years going to be very important is facilitating integration into electronic medical health, where especially the testing is done in a hospital setting or even in a private lab. Can that report be absorbed into a patient's medical record? Uh, in many parts of the world now, this is happening actively where that integration is set up. Here in the U.S., in my lab, we integrate directly into the HL7, rec uh, it's a HL7 file transfer to the uh, patient record itself. Moving on from that, the reporting guidelines uh, are important. What guidelines are used for reporting? Now, largely, the clinical report is based on Fundamentally, the CLIA uh, uh, guidelines and then the CAP, as I mentioned, the College of American Pathologists does give guidelines in its a checklist where it specifically asks question, does the report describe this? But CLIA was really done in 1980s and CLIA has not been revised since then. So CLIA is a little bit dated in that approach because so much uh, advances have happened since then. But ACMG, AMP, and uh, CAP um, got together in about 2013 uh, to write the sequence interpretation guidelines. And I sat on that committee and it was probably the, one of the most challenging things I have done in my career. It took us two years to come out with the guidelines. And that was for a specific reason, um, because those guidelines not only needed to be clear but also how to apply them in interpretation and writing a clinical report and this is where a lot of criticism came uh, afterwards because the guidelines were never written for a specific gene 
they were written for all genes as an umbrella guideline and now you might have heard that ClinGen has groups or committees working on specific guidelines. So I um, co-chair the P10 committee and as we know that P10 has got very two distinct disorders associated with it, which is a leaf uh, the um, a cancer and then you have uh, the autism spectrum disorder. So this does get challenging when you're actually uh, the sort of putting this guide. Now, looking at the reporting elements, the first and the foremost is that the lab should follow the SGVS guidelines. Um, what has happened in the last five years is that many labs are moving towards using uh, more automated uh, nomenclature systems from standardized uh, or uh, commercially available rather software. Many of these software companies are not following the most preferred nomenclature. This creates a lot of confusion. So I used to um, evaluate all the sequencing results for CAP proficiency testing and this was the most common problem where for the same nucleotide change, the protein change would be written in variety of different formats. So you have to make sure that the lab is following a common SGVS common preferred guidelines. When two lab reports do not match, if you are using more than one lab to order the testing, it will be very clear to you so that you can ask this question actively. Followed by the results, the interpretation, methodology, references and databases used for interpretation and notes and disclaimers. So I'm going to get into each of these uh, areas and see what a physician should be looking at when a clinical report is delivered. So let's start with the results. It is very important that at before looking at the result that the clinical information you have provided to the laboratory is mentioned at the top of the report because that is clearly the basis of that interpretation. A single line description of the findings of the test performed. So in, I've given you the example of Rett syndrome here which is a MACP2 gene and then a very simple statement of whether a pathogenic variant was detected or not detected, variant of unknown uncertain significance which is probably a result you do not want to see or no pathogenic variant detected. And variant of uncertain significance uh, probably is uh, you know something which a, a physician and many physicians complain about and what we don't know what to do with it. Um, I would say this today about in all, in all the genetic testing that is happening across the world, at least 50% of the changes reported are variants of uncertain significance. And the reason for that is that, and especially the variants which fall into this category are missense changes and some actually nonsense uh, pathogenic variants and insertions and deletions as well. And the reason for that is we still don't understand what are the common variants in different populations. So in order to not over interpret, it is important to maintain this category because the consequence of reporting a pathogenic variant which could be used for prenatal diagnosis can be devastating if the, uh, va uh, if the variant is not causative of disease or benign. The other thing to remember of variant of uncertain significance is the piece which I mentioned earlier that majority of the genes are new genes. There is not enough literature available today to interpret the variants in these genes. So that's just a process of data accumulation. I think the important thing as a physician should be to follow up on that variant of uncertain significance after about every six months asking the lab to reinterpret it or at least calling the lab if there is any update on that variant if you are going to see the patient again in clinic. So looking at the panels, exomes and genomes, another complexity is the multiple answers that come with more when more than one gene is testing tested. And it's important that the lab actually gives the most relevant finding first. 
And now this is a very tricky thing. And the reason I say this is if there are five genes uh, identified with variants of unknown significance or one gene which has a pathogenic variant, but it's important to report the other four variants of uncertain significance. Sometimes labs go in alphabetical order and at times the, path the gene in the pathogenic variant could be the last row in that table. This is really not good for a physician. The, uh, the pathogenic variant should be right up at the top so that the physician can see it. But there is a consequence of doing that too because then physicians tend to ignore the variants of unknown significance. This is very important. The, the main thing is that the pathogenic variant uh, matches up your, with your patient's phenotype so you have an answer. Now there might be some features which do not 100% match up with the patient's phenotype and that's why it's important to look at those variants of uncertain significance. That do Is there any variant that is close to your patient's phenotype and you do not want to ignore it and maybe follow up with additional testing of the family so moving on to interpretation now, the classification of the variants and I know that there are presentations uh, about how to classify a variant. I'm going to touch very briefly on this is the predicted effect on the resultant protein, the functional assays such as biochemical testing, the recommendations that are made for the physician in the clinical report and then follow familial testing. So. Today what most labs do is classify the variants using the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics guidelines. But the effect on the uh, or the um, final uh, outcome of that uh, specific variant on the pro protein, the important word to remember here, it's a prediction. It's a prediction based on what we understand of that gene and and the interpretation of uh, uh, of the publications and the assays used to interpret the uh, function of the gene and the variants in those genes so again it's a predicted effect but the bio the functional assays is where this becomes important so if the gene is causing a loss of function event and if you find a insertion deletion or a not Pathogen, nonsense pathogenic variant, the answer is pretty straightforward. But if it is a missing change, it's really important to follow up with additional functional testing if possible. Many labs today are starting to launch RNA sequencing. I, I, that is going to become widely available soon. But there are some simpler assays to do as well. One example I'm going to give he, you here is Pompe disease. We know that there is a neonatal Pompe, there's adult onset Pompe as well. And if a variant is identified through molecular testing, which matches the patient's phenotype, a biochemical assay can be done to confirm uh, that it is Pompe uh, disease. So those recommendations are very important when looking at and reading the interpretation. So as I mentioned, these guidelines have been going on for a while. You know, the original guideline really started in 2003, uh, started by Dr. Burdett at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, and then every four or five years, new versions and improved versions of these guidelines kept coming out. Uh, it is really not easy to write these guidelines. Um, I have been on this committee since 2007, and it's a very enriching experience to just sit with you know, the fellow geneticists. Uh, if you, on the 2015 committee, we had clinical geneticists, molecular geneticists, biochemical geneticists, and cytogeneticists sitting on this committee, including someone doing somatic disease, uh, Julie Gastier Foster. And that collective experience went into writing this uh, sequencing guidelines. But it's five years since those guidelines have been written and many people ask when new guidelines are going to come. What has happened post these guidelines is ClinGen got formed and now guidelines are being written more which are gene or disease. So the elements of inter interpretation are critical and this is really important for a physician to understand when looking at the report. Labs use databases for interpretation. 
labs read and download literature for interpretation but they also do other things such as computational predictions uh, looking at whether that particular nucleotide change is conserved down in different species and then functional evidence when looking at these last three categories it's important to read and make your assessment that whether the lab has described the prediction the conservation and the functional evidence adequately and what do i mean by that the functional evidence for example has to be described with references that there is such and such a reference which showed decrease enzyme activity or expression for you to be convinced this is very important when also looking at variants of uncertain significance i personally do not put heavy weightage on computational predictions and conservation if you read the literature throughout about 60% of the time this is accurate 40% of the time it is not accurate and i think some of you might not agree with me but i don't put a lot of weightage on that some labs do put heavy weightage on that and it's important for that reason to read the clinical report and what it is saying now with gene uh, panels and exomes and genomes um, variants in disease genes with a definitive association with the reported phenotype so you could just find one change but there could be many other changes there are incidental findings and pharmacogenetic markers especially in the exome and genome sequencing the last two categories are driven by a consent form so on the consent form if the patient or their family has consented to receive incidental findings or pharmacogenetic findings only then they are reported many times we get calls where the physician will say i did not get this two uh, categories that is usually because the patient has not consented for it so it's important that the upfront consenting appropriately the variants are usually mentioned in a form of a table and i'm going to show you examples soon of how a table should look and how what a physician should be reading from that table and then last and which is little confusing even as a geneticist is the description of decrease penetrance and variable expressivity if relevant um one example i can give you for variable expressivity is myotonic uh, dystrophy where there could be a significant uh, uh, difference and with with the anticipation phenomenon in expressivity and this is really important to describe in a clinical report methodology i think i started this presentation with methodology and why methodology is important especially when the result is negative so that the physician can decide what next steps to take so the method used to perform the assay the metrics of the assay and the types of variants detected by the assay but probably in a negative setting the most important thing to look at is the limitations of the assay itself that does the assay uh, cover what you expected it to cover so a very simple example for pseudo genes i'm going to give you is gaucher disease this gene has a pseudo gene cannot be done by next generation sequencing very likely you have to do sanger sequencing and if one of your diagnosis is the possibility of gache and the panel does not cover it then you have actually uh, ordered a test which is not going to give you the answer so these uh, minor things which look minor are actually very important and this is what a genetic counselor usually does because the genetic counselor has the responsibility to make sure that the appropriate test is ordered and from a lab which has got the most comprehensive assay again cost becomes a uh, important decision factor as well but we are not going to talk about that in this presentation the methods description you know there are so many methods now and so many variety of uh, different techniques even for sequencing and as a physician it can be very difficult to actually sort of even decide which um you know method this lab has described is this uh, appropriate method or not or have you ordered the right uh, test or not so 
the easiest path to follow is that for panels, exomes, and genomes, next generation sequencing is used. But look at the limitations of the test of what that assay cannot cover so that it can uh, direct you into the appropriate uh, uh, next assay to order or test to order if the test is negative. For example, if the limitation is that it cannot detect copy number variation, then you probably are going to go ahead and order MLPA to uh, identify the deletions and the duplications in the genes of your interest. Now, one of the very interesting things which has happened over the past decade, unfortunately, is that gene names keep changing. Um, you know, as the Hugo committee goes through looking through the genes and, uh, and the, their names, in fact, uh, when I was on the CAP Genomic Medicine Committee, we had approached Hugo to work with us collaboratively to make standardized gene names for clinical use. Uh, you know, in a research setting, in a discovery setting, it's okay, but it really does not work well in a clinical setting. I'll give you one example is a Kabuki syndrome. When I started next generation sequencing in 2010, it, the gene name was MLL2, and now it is KMT2D. It gets very difficult for a physician, if I can say that as a geneticist or a molecular geneticist, it's hard for us also to keep track of it. But many labs have now sort of learned to do this is to give the a also known as names and please if your clinic if your gene is not covered then um, ask that question if there is a, a gene name change which is not covered in this uh, in a particular panel the reference sequence numbers as a physician it's very hard to fa uh, you know pay your attention to that because the reference sequence numbers change but as long as they're given on the report, um, uh, it is good because if you're going to order more testing or send it to another lab, that NM number is what that other lab is going to pick up. Genomic build numbers are also there on the method. Again, you don't need to understand what these build numbers mean, but the method should give these three things. The gene name, also known as reference the sequence number, given you the example, it always starts with NM and the genomic build number. And again, a genetic counselor can The types of variants detected by the assay, as I mentioned very early on, the panels, exomes, genomes, and single genes. It's really important to know that if the assay is comprehensive to detect all types of variants or is focused only on the sequence variants, which is point mutations and small indels, or can detect copy number variations uh, which is missing chunks of exons or the uh, genomic sequence itself. And then lastly, um, the limitation of the methodology, limitation of types of variants detected and giving the guidance to the physician if additional testing is required. So for those of you who are also involved in laboratory reporting uh, and are physicians, uh, you, you know that what a physician is looking for and making sure that those elements are there on the report. And for a physician who is getting a report, asking these questions to a lab when you see that these uh, pieces are missing in the lab itself. The, uh, one of the pieces which is very important to also uh, sort of focus on is what has happened in the last 10 years. A lot of sequencing is happening all over the globe. Many people, uh, groups are doing free databases some are not. Some labs are actually paid databases where you have to pay a few dollars to get the information about the variant. But ClinVar, SGMD, local country-based databases, LOVDs are available. And it's very important that when a physician is looking at a report, there is a reference given. And if the reference is not given, it will all, should say that this particular variant has not been seen before, but is ex to be expected a causative of disease based on the known uh, pathogenic variant spectrum of the gene. The databases itself also become very complicated. And one example I'm going to give you here is OMIM. OMIM, the online Mendelian inheritance in man, tends to absorb the new genes into OMIM, but they never really go back and actually curate what they have mentioned in OMIM. 
So if you go back to the sort of the, the some of the older genes, let's say cystic fibrosis, OMI may not have updated a particular variant which was discovered in 1999 and reported as pathogenic and today after a lot of sequencing it has become benign. OMIM does not update that. And for countries where access to database is not there, this can be very tricky and lead to false interpretation and therefore, you know, false uh, or incorrect medical management for the patient. And these kind of subtle differences exist in most databases. So the physician should look at what database was referred to uh, before, you know, running with that answer the lab has actually given. These are a couple of uh, my publications, uh, which I really enjoyed doing collaboratively. Uh, one was free the data that how we took the approach to uh, releasing all the variants in my lab when I was at uh, running the Emory Genetics Lab. And also, uh, you know, creating this uh, uh, Dick Cotton, uh, who, was a, who was a founder of SGVS, um, had asked me to write this article on just imagine if we are going to create a global variant database for personalized medicine, what it would look like. Um, it was a very sort of uh, enjoyable activity to do. It's not easy to bring databases together so that physicians can just do a one click. But I think that process is ongoing and probably in another five years, we might actually get an integrated database. And the last one, which I, I'm going to go into a little bit later in this presentation is talking about the reassessment of the genomic variation with especially focusing on variants of uncertain significance. And the last bit in the clinical report is the pitfalls in laboratory testing, sample quality, sample mix up, presence of rare sequence variants under PCR primers are some of the common reasons where a lab might have a false negative result. Um, you know, many times it's not under the control of the lab itself because, you know, if you're testing someone in a, from a population which has not been tested before in this particular laboratory, the primer actually might sit on a variation and you will get a false negative result. So these are always questions that are going to remain with a physician that is the negative report really negative, but your clinical acumen here is the one to follow in terms of making the, the next decisions. Nowadays, we get cases where they have been tested somewhere else and then they test again with us. And at times we do find answers. Um, this is just because the methodology difference or the depth of sequencing used, but at least some standard approach has to be followed by the physicians, checking the depth of sequencing, limitations of the test, uh, and is the lab writing the report appropriate? One of the important things which is more recently happening now in the world of uh, genomic testing is giving physicians um, uh, the um, information for patient advocacy groups, clinical trials and research. And we have actively started doing that because as a physician, you have a very busy clinic. You do not have necessarily the time to go and look for this. I think Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a classic example now where Clinical trials are ongoing. There are patient advocacy groups in most countries and giving the opportunity to that patient to enroll in a clinical trial is important. So these are some suggestions you can yourself give to the lab you're sending your testing to so that they can start giving this information. Uh, we have implemented a variety of ways such as uh, uh, giving that uh, information actively to the physician helping patients connect with other families, uh, the financial support in terms of the testing itself, patient registries, absolutely critical for clinical trials as pharma companies buy these registries so that they can enroll patients. And they really want early onset patients who have not made, uh, who do not have a progressed uh, disease because uh, some of the newer technologies as CRISPR-Cas9 are very effective when the, uh, when the treatment is given early on. So the opportunity to participate in clinical trials is very important.
Lastly, we will look at the variant reanalysis piece of it. When a report is negative or when a variant of un uncertain significance is uh, given, the physician should actively call the laboratory about six months uh, after receiving the report for asking for reclassification. As I mentioned, there are many databases coming up and this uh, updating of the variant is important as we go through this process of uh, testing and answer for the patient itself. Now, confirmation of the clinical findings is also important that if you are suspicious or not totally convinced that the, uh, the confirmatory testing uh, is needed because of the clinical features not matching the gene, uh, it's important to actively contact the laboratory and put and ask for it when doing the um, uh, when uh, uh, looking at the clinical report. One which uh, also becomes very important is uh, the special considerations such as the evidence for causality, especially in the new gene, you will find many times only a single gene report is there. And as much as the lab wants to give you information at that time, it's important that you might need to go and actually read that publication because there are so many genes of uncertain significance as well. We call them the gooses. Uh, and assessment of that with the phenotype is important. Some assays do cover mitochondrial variants. The mitochondrial variants are usually about 1% of the total uh, va variant spectrum that is reported in the literature uh, today. But and mitochondrial uh, identification uh, can also differ whether a specific tissue is tested or not. So uh, there are mit mitochondrial deple depletion syndromes as well. So now many exome and genome assays do re report mitochondrial variants. And if you are suspicious of a mitochondrial disorder, it's important to make sure that the lab is actually doing it and has mentioned in their reports. And lastly is the other variants category, which depends on exome and genome, which you can choose by the consent form. But the risk alleles, I personally today am still skeptical about risky reporting risky risk alleles, which I think are risky because they can skew the uh, clinical interpretation because they are an odds ratio of having a disorder. So asthma and diabetes are good examples of that and still they fall in this risk alleles uh, unless you have a monogenic diabetes type disorder where you have known specific genes. So next five minutes, let's quickly look at some examples. My own research career has been on neuromuscular disorders and I've, uh, uh, I do a lot of neuromuscular testing in my clinical laboratory. So I'm going to give you examples um, based on uh, neuromuscular disorders, but largely in the field of neurology. And I've put the link to the Child Neurology Foundation, which have a whole list of pediatric neurological disorders. Uh, we offer in our own laboratory a neuro neuromuscular panel and a comprehensive uh, neuromuscular panel and a neurology panel with all sorts of overlapping disorders. It gets just really, really interesting. So let's look at this first example, which is uh, a whole genome sequencing on a 25-year-old male, female. Uh, and you can see the range of uh, clinical presentation here, which can get very confusing. Probably the most important ones, which is neurodegeneration, hearing loss, brain atrophy, and developmental regression. She also had some dystonia. So they had done a ton of testing before they actually ordered whole genome sequencing. And what we found is a... A uh, pathogenic variant in a gene called NARS2, NARS2, which causes oxidative phosphorylation deficiency. Now, this variant was previously reported by another lab, which was doing exome sequencing, but they had not reported the copy number variation, which we could easily detect using whole genome sequencing. And you can see there that we detected the deletion of exon 8 and 9. The next one is an exome sequencing example on a 30-year-old male with short stature, motor development, and joint dislocations and reported muscular dystrophy. What we found is a very rare disorder uh, which, uh, which is caused by in a, a pathogenic variants in a gene called EXOC6B. 
Now this did not, there was, they had already done a uh, panel before and it did not get detected because of this confusing clinical presentation. But when they did exome sequencing, we were able to find a homozygous change. It's autosomal recessive condition. And the last one is a neuromuscular condition, a proband with uh, 10 years of age, a female with muscular hypotonia, dystrophy, and difficulty walking. And you might think of certain genes immediately, but what we found is a copy number variation, which includes two genes, uh, CLCN1 and DNAJB6. So DNAJB6 is one of the most recently identified genes which causes autosomal dominant limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And then CLCN1 causes um, myotonia congenita. And now you can see that we really have two overlapping disorders in one uh, comprehensive or one common event of a copy number variation which could have been missed by sequencing completely. So last two slides, really I'm going to talk about the why it is important to read the methodology. I think I've said this many times I and mean, I want to show examples of my own lab. But whichever lab you're ordering your test from and you're looking at the report, the report uh, methodology should be comprehensive. It looks long, but it is very important. And very quickly, I'm going to go over what are the essential elements to quickly look at. When it is whole genome sequencing, you want to look at the type of sequencing done. Nowadays, it is 150 base pair. Coverage should be more than 95%. And then what is the minimum cutoff to make a variant call? 20x. And what does the test actually cover? So you can see here that we are saying that we can detect single nucleotide variation, indels, copy number variation, mitochondrial variation, and it becomes a very comprehensive assay. We can also detect mosaicism. Whole exome sequencing should be standard today is about 100 base pair, 2 by 100 base pairs, but the depth of sequencing is about 100x. Uh, so we see, as I mentioned, whole genome sequencing was at 40x and whole exome sequencing is done at 100x sequencing. And then the last one is a panel, which again is done at 100x uh, depth but cannot uh, uh, cover many times copy number variation. In our lab, we are able to do copy number variation, but many times it is not covered, depends on the laboratory which is doing the testing. I'm gonna finish off with uh, my acknowledgements. These are my lab directors uh, who have worked with me for a very, very long time, almost 10 to 15 years, have followed me from Emory to Perkin Elmer. Um, we have global labs in India, China, Malaysia, Sweden, and US. So the database gets rich with uh, different types of sequence variation. I really enjoy talking to Dr. Skaria about that. Um, Zeke Ma and Abhinav Mathur are the two individuals who drive our variant database and help us with the interpretation. Uh, we have written our own software, which is called Order Data Interpretation Network, which assembles all the variants together. And I'm very thankful to them, which they have really improved our quality of variant interpretation. And we take feedback actively from the physicians on how to interpret or how to write a better report so that they can take it and use it uh, in the clinic. With that, I will stop and thank you for listening. I'll take uh, questions now. Thank you.